Good morning. It is good to see everyone this morning. I hope you're staying um, well and dry in the midst of, um, I guess, what was a tropical storm that I didn't even know was coming until it hit us. Um, but we can use the rain. But glad to be with you all this morning. Um, we're gonna. We are blessed to have Dr. Roberta Bondi with us this morning. Um, many of you know her. Quite a few of you who've um, worked with her or had classes with her uh, when you. We're at Candler, um, but um, just a little, a little bit about Dr. Bondi. Um, I've graduated from SMU with a degree in English literature um, and then studied at Perkins School of Theology, um, Oxford University, um, and got her doctorate at Oxford. Um, she taught at Notre Dame um, in the 70s and then at Candler School of Theology, which is where a lot of us um, know the name from. Um, has written quite a few books, um, married to Richard Bondi, um, has two children. Um, how old are your grandchildren, Roberta? Uh, well, one is 21 and the other 17. Okay, great. Um, two grandchildren and uh, a little dog. You said dog, dog's name is Curly? That's right, and he's making rattling noises in the background with his collar. Oh, good. <laughs> one of the other joys of Zoom. Um, She's been uh, working and teaching with the Academy of Spiritual Formation since her retirement. Um, and in her words, has become a fanatical weaver, which is interesting um, to hear. But we are um, we are fortunate to have um, Dr. Bondi with us again. Um, and um, you've, I think, spoken at one of these lecture series before. Is that right? You done this? Uh, no, I haven't. Oh, OK. I know. You've been with us at one of the previous ones. So we're well, glad to have you with us. Um, so I'm going to hand it over and uh, let you um, teach us. Um, as the, we've just started a couple of weeks ago, and we're in this series on renewal, where we're kind of looking at some of the history of the church and the current state of the church and who we want to be as the church moving forward. And so we'll, um, yeah, I'm going to um, hand that over and let Dr. Bondi um, speak with us this morning. So welcome, and thanks for being with us. Uh, well, I'm glad to be here. Uh, this is a kind of daunting task because I decided I wanted to share with you the most important thing that I know. Well, I'm almost 80 years old. And I've learned quite a few things. So uh, we'll, we'll do our best not to be too scattered, but, um, but here goes anyway. Um, what I want to teach talk about today is um, the life-saving teaching of the teachers that I had back from the fourth and sixth century. No, obviously I was not alive in the fourth and sixth century, but I read them and studied them. Uh, let me say that uh, to begin with, to tell you where we are, um, that the Christianity I grew up with was not oppressive in the sense that people were trying to shove stuff down my throat all the time, but it was, uh, did take the form that it takes in the South where we are now uh, so often where the whole point of Christianity is forgiveness of sins so you can go to heaven. Uh, uh, I, I didn't actually get that from my parents, but I, I did get that from church, uh, which was various, various churches while I was growing up. It wasn't just, just one church. Uh, but I did grow up in a very perfectionistic family where uh, it, as the oldest child, I never did anything right my whole life. Uh, and I started graduate school, even after seminary, with the uh, knowledge in my bones, because that's where we keep the knowledge from when we're really little children, that the main thing God was interested in in me was my sin, my failures, uh, my imperfections, my lacks, and that the only thing I could do about it was to confess all those things because if I didn't 
it was going to end very badly for me. Uh, this was not an easy kind of Christianity to grow up with. I think a lot of children, as I did, uh, almost uh, invent their own uh, form of Christianity around the basic teachings they hear. And that's what I did. Uh, so that by the time I got to graduate school, I was not intending to do work in Christianity at all. I was intending to do work in Semitic languages, which was what my first degree at Oxford was in. But it didn't work out that way. Uh, it's a long story about how I got to Christianity from, uh, uh, from Semitic languages. But I will say that all the material that I worked on in my graduate work was Christian and it was in Semitic languages. So uh, this is a little joke. God has a way of getting us in the right place at the right time. Uh, the teachers that I'm going to talk to you about today were the, the folks who invented monasticism in the fourth through the sixth century. Uh, these first teachers were living in the Middle East. Uh, most of them were in uh, Egypt in the desert, but Many of them were also in Palestine. And the main person I'm going to talk about today, Dorotheus of Gaza, was indeed in uh, Palestine. These folks who founded monasticism founded it because they understood Jesus's message in very radical terms. They understood it was a, 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 a radical message, which it was. If you think of it, we usually hear the Sermon on the Mount and we kind of uh, interpret it in such a way as to make it much gentler than it actually is. But if we look at <laughs> Jesus' teacher who taught by his wife as well as what he said, he didn't leave too much room for fooling around. Uh, anyway, the, uh, uh, for example, you know, he says foxes have holes, birds have nests, uh, the son of humanity has no place to put his head. You know, the early Christians who wanted to become, to take up this radical lifestyle <clears throat> that they saw Jesus having, uh, saw these things and said, okay, this is what we need. If this is what Jesus is teaching, this is what we need to. Now that sounds like these are not people we would want to associate with um, as uh, people who would have the answer to what to do with the sort of perfectionism and emphasis on sin and so forth that I uh, grew up with. But in fact, they were. And this is the way they understood the whole thing. I don't, I'm not sure if we have, uh, and the place I live in North Georgia now, it's really true. Uh, the emphasis on in Christianity seems to be on being righteous, avoiding sin so you can go to heaven. And so I live in a place where this is not characteristic of our church at all, but uh, where the, the whole business of, of not sinning just takes the place of everything else in Christianity. Uh, for example, we have uh, stones all over the place uh, in Blue Ridge, close to where we live, uh, with the Ten Commandments engraved on them. Now, why the Ten Commandments? You know, why not the Beatitudes? But they aren't. It's because it's the shall not, thou shalt nots that, that really matter the most. Uh, that is not the way the early people who founded monasticism understood the goal of Christianity. What they understood, and I completely agree with them now, is that the goal of being Christian 
is to grow in love until we are transformed into love. In case this has a familiar sound to it, this also is pretty much the same as the Methodist idea of perfection. Methodist idea of perfection is not don't make any, don't ever do anything wrong. It's becoming completely transformed into love. And that is what the goal of these early monastic teachers uh, were, um, were trying to get to. Now, just a small aside that isn't very aside, uh, they were convinced that if they were to be able to live out what they intended to live out, they needed to have a goal. Uh, one of the teachers, uh, Anthony, who was one of the founding fathers, uh, used to say that no one picks up a bar of iron, puts it on a forge and starts hammering and says, gee, I wonder if I'm going to make a plow or a sword. You start in advance making up your mind what you're going to create and then you do it. In the same way, we need to choose what it is that we are aiming at as Christians. And then achieving that becomes our lifetime work. And hopefully for us, that goal is the goal of love of God, love of self, and love of others. Now, There was a sixth century teacher named Dorotheus of Gaza. Dorotheus, by the way, is a boy's name and not a girl's name. Uh, but he was, a, he was a sixth century a teacher who was also the head of a monastery in Gaza. And he went on to found a couple of other ones. But he seems to have been, we have quite a lot of his writings left, by the way. So we, we can say pretty uh, things about what he was like and what he taught and so forth. But he um, apparently in the monastery where he was the abbot, one of its characteristics was that the monks who lived there fought with each other all the time. And it just drove him crazy. So one of the things we have uh, surviving from Dorotheus is a bunch of his sermons and his sermons are on all <clears throat> different but all of them end in the same place which is please stop fighting and start loving each other uh, now one of them I has really been helpful to me in my life and I hope you'll find something helpful in it yourself this is not the the I, I will not read you the sermon. We'll be glad to know. But Dorotheus is trying to explain to the monks why they ought to fight with each other. And he is telling them that they don't understand the nature of reality. He says the whole business of what we're about is love. And, and then he lays out a diagram for them. So this is going to involve you using your imagination. Uh, to, uh, to uh, make this diagram in your own head. You have a piece of paper, you can do it on your piece of paper. Uh, it's not very complicated. He says, Dorothea says, put a point on your piece of paper and draw a circle around it. And he says, use a compass, but who has a compass these days? So draw a circle, put a point in the middle. He says, the point in the middle, imagine, is God. The circle around God are human lives. Now, pretend you're drawing a picture of a pie. They didn't actually have pies like this in the ancient desert, but that's okay. Uh, pretend you're drawing a pie and draw lines outside of the circle in to God so that they all come together in the middle at the point. Is everybody with me so far? Yeah. Okay, that's good. Okay, so we have a circle with lines that go toward the middle. 
He says, each one of these lines is a human life. Each one of these lines is a human life. Now, notice, he says, that the closer we move along that line to the center of the circle where God is, the closer we also move to each other, to other people. The closer we move to God, the closer we necessarily move to each other if we take this as uh, if we follow this chart that Dorothy is, is laying out. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. You know, one of the bad things about Zoom is I can't get any reaction. Uh, but oh well. Uh, so he also says, so notice that as we move close to God and move close to each other, and the same way, if we move away from other people, we are also moving away from God. If we move away from other people, we are moving away from God. So that, says Dorothy, there is no way to love God without other, also loving other people. Of course, this language that Dorothy is just using is metaphorical. He doesn't actually think the world is a, a big circle with a point in the middle where God is. But his point that we are all moving toward God, wherever God is, most of us think God is pretty much everywhere. As we are moving toward God, we can't move toward God without also moving toward each other. Uh, uh, I have heard people say, and this this is something uh, that I that was also in the, the Brothers Karamazov, which is, as far as I'm concerned, the greatest novel ever written. But one of the characters in it is complaining and saying, "I could love God, but I just can't love other people. I can't stand other people." Well, this woman was told pretty much that it's just not possible to love God and not love other people. But that is, I, I, I just, I love Dorothea's diagram because it really does describe <clears throat> the way we all relate to each other in the world and with each other and with God. What's the now, name? what was that? What was the novel, the name of the novel? Oh, The Brothers Karamazov. Oh, yeah. Okay. Russian novel by Dostoevsky. Yep. My Thank you. The whole world. Okay. So we know that we're talking metaphorically and that Dorotheus doesn't actually think the world is a, is a pie with a point in the middle, but he actually does think that all things are moving toward God. And I, I believe that too. They've convinced me over the years that all of reality is moving toward God all the time because that's the way we're made. That's our basic relationship uh, to God. Okay. Now, so this... So they are saying, okay, if you're going to love God, you have to love the neighbor. And there's another uh, characteristic in there, too. If we're going to love the neighbor, we are also going to have to love ourselves. But we'll talk about that in a little bit. What I want to start with is how we love God, what love actually is, and go on from there. Uh, first of all, I think that an awfully lot of us, maybe even most of us, believe that from the moment we become Christian, whenever that is, if it's from a conversion experience or uh, a baptismal experience or whatever, that from the moment we become Christian, we love God and we love our neighbor. This is the way it is and this is what it's supposed to be. 
these early monastic teachers, the fathers and mothers or the Abbas and the Amas of the early church did not believe that. What they believe is not that we start out loving other people and God from the moment we become Christian, but that it is our goal, that love is a goal. In some senses, it's a starting point, but it, it's a goal that always is moving in front of us. By the way, it's important again to say that this is our Methodist heritage in, as well, uh, what uh, John Wesley uh, taught. To think of love as a goal is very, very free because in a world where there's lots of emphasis on a Christian world where there's lots of emphasis on sin, to think of not loving other people, we automatically put it in the category of sin. At least this is what I have heard and what I have been taught. This is not the way the, the early monastic teachers look at it. They look at it as since love is the goal of the Christian life, that we are going to spend most of our life learning how to love. Love is not natural in the world we live in. It's natural in the sense that we're made in the image of God who is love, but it is not characteristic of life in the world as most of us uh, experience it. We didn't grow up that way. We've had the sorts of things happen to us that, uh, well, we've had lots of bad things happen to us. That's the nature of life. But love of the neighbor is something that we have to learn how to do. Uh, Dorotheus of Gaza, who is the one who just gave us that wonderful diagram of the circle was asked one time, well, how do I learn to love my neighbor? And he said, as so many of the early teachers said, well, we just do it a little bit at a time. He said, supposing we have a neighbor we can't stand. Unfortunately, a lot of us have neighbors we have trouble with, but supposing we have a neighbor we can't stand. So we're not going to jump right in and throw our arms around the neighbor and say, oh, I loved you, I loved you. Uh, what we're going to do is to try to learn to love the neighbor a little bit at a time. And Dorothy says that we do it by doing things for the neighbor. You know, you find the garbage can lying out in the street, put it up on the curb. Uh, you know, bring in the newspaper for the neighbor. But to, to start little and to do things that make us think automatically of our neighbor when we do anything until we get to the point where whenever we think of something we're going to do for ourselves, our neighbor's well-being is also in the back of our mind. And that way, gradually, Dorothy says, we come to love our neighbor as ourselves. Now, I like that. That's pretty realistic, I think. Uh, sometimes we do all those things and it feels like we're still not loving our neighbor because our neighbor is very difficult. Or we have the kinds of blocks in ourselves that make it very hard to love our neighbor. Uh, for example, the neighbor reminds us of somebody in our family that, that has given us a hard time in the past and may still be. Uh, but the point here is that the goal of the Christian life is love. And we work at it little by little until we start making some progress. Uh, now, does this mean that when we're not making progress, we're failing? No, it just means that we are doing uh, exactly what human beings do when they learn uh, to love. Now, one of the things that makes it easier to learn to love the neighbor is learning how to love God. And to learn to love God, we have to learn who God is. 
Now, notice again that just as these teachers say that love is not something we automatically do from the moment we become Christian, we don't love our neighbor. In the same way, we have to learn to love God. We have to learn to love God. Uh, most of us, and when I say most, I'm, I'm speaking from the experience of the, the people that I've known and taught uh, over the years. That the first thing that I have to say about that is that everybody thinks they ought to love God. Everybody thinks if they're a Christian, they do love God. Or at least they ought to love God. But just as I grew up with an understanding of God as someone who followed me around all day long, like my father, criticizing everything I did, seeing every flaw I had and every mistake I made, if they think of God in those terms as judge before anything else, there is not really very much way to love that God. If God is simply a judge who follows us around being interested in the things that we do wrong, this is not going to be easy to learn to love God. So one of the things we have to do, not after we learn to love our neighbor, but at the same time we're learning to love our neighbor, is to learn who God actually is. We have to learn who God actually is. That, in the words of St. John, God is love. God is God's self love. Now, the, one of the teachings of the Abbas that I particularly like is uh, one of the fathers said that if you look at the saints and who they meant by that or those of us who are moving as close to God as we could get by becoming like God, uh, if you notice that as the saints get closer to God, the less interested they are in other people's sin to the point where they finally get so they just don't see other people's sin. They're, they're uh, embodying non-judgmentalism to the extent where making judgments on somebody else almost, it almost doesn't have any reality. So the closer they get to God, the less they see each other's, other people's uh, sins or flaws or wrongdoing or whatever you want to, to call it. So if we are to learn to love God, first of all, we need to learn that that is the way God is with us. If this is the way the saints are, and we are all made in the image of God, this is the way the saints are, and this is the way God is. God is really just not interested in the things we do wrong. God is too busy loving the world, loving individual people, loving us, to be very interested in the things that we do wrong. Now, if you think that's not true, let me just very quickly give you an analogy. If we are God's children, born of God, as we believe we are, think about what a parent, a new parent is like. Think about what a new parent is like, especially a mother, but fathers are like this too. Mothers and fathers of new babies just don't think in terms of sin when it comes to their little children, unless there's something wrong, uh, in which case we call it abuse. But if a baby who is six months old cries and cries and cries and the parent wants the baby to stop, a good parent understands that there's a reason for that baby crying 
and it isn't because it's a bad baby. God loves the child. God loves us in the same way that parents will love a six month old baby who is crying and driving them up the wall in some ways. Parents are so much more concerned with loving that child than finding anything the matter with the child in the way of the child doing something wrong. It's just not even funny. Uh, it is uh, characteristic of many of the teachers to think in these terms. So it's not that God doesn't see our sins. It's just that God is not very interested in our sins. And if this is the case, uh, then we're relating to God entirely the wrong way if we think of God as simply a judge. Now, when we are able to give up this idea of the main characteristic of God as judgment, then we are also able to start learning and we again we have to learn learning to give up our judging of other people ourselves many many sayings in the sayings of the desert fathers indicate that the thing that gets us most in trouble is our judgmentalism uh, one of my favorite sayings and i have many many favorite sayings uh, of one of the abbas was do not judge because the same one who said, do not fornicate, said, do not judge. The passing judgment on our neighbor is just as serious as anything we can do in terms of breaking our, the commandments. Now, there were two or three strong reasons they felt like this, that this was an important part of learning to uh, love God and love uh, other people. Uh, the, the first one was that if we are going to draw close to other people as we draw close to God, and if we're going to draw close to God as we draw closer to other people, then we simply can't separate ourselves from other people in such a way that we'd say, she's doing that today. I would never do that. He did that. How could he do that? That's unspeakable. I would never do that. This is making a big division between myself and other people in such a way that it's like having a, a, a great gully, a great valley lying between me and the other person. And how can we get across that if the first thing we see when we look at someone else is what they're doing wrong? Now, we can say, oh, I'm not judgmental, but the fact is we live in a society that judges all the time. You know, first thing you do is, is to remember and then notice the advertising, for example. The whole of advertising is built on the notion that I am supposed to buy something that is better than my neighbor's. Uh, it may be that it's not always the case, but it's generally the case. Uh, I need a new car, so I'll look good against my neighbor's car uh, and, and so forth. We live, in a, we live in a culture where we just judge ourselves against, measure ourselves against other people all the time. And every time we measure ourselves against someone else, we are judging that person as well, by the way, is judging ourselves. So the most important characteristic of a life in which we are learning to love is learning to be non-judgmental. Now, this is not because it's a bad thing to be judgmental and you'll go to hell if you do it. It's because the judgments we make separate ourselves separate us from the people around us in all sorts of subtle ways because it's they're all based on on the on the assumption that I am not like that 
or I don't want to be like that. Get that person away from me. And that you just can't love from that position. Uh, you also don't just kind of jump into the whole business of non-judgmentalism and say, okay, I'm not going to make any judgments ever again. We, we just can't do that. It would be nice if we could do that. I would love it if we could do that. But I myself have never known anybody who could pull that one off. Certainly not, not me. So how do we learn not to be judgmental? Well, the first thing is we take it on as, a, as an active project. We think about it a lot. Uh, we're still not going to be able to do it without God's grace and our own work, but we think about it a, a lot. We learn to observe ourselves and listen to the things we say to ourselves, even if we don't say them out loud. Hmm, I'm glad I'm not her size. Or, 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 boy, he sure has a temper. I, I'm, I'm glad I don't have that kind of temper. It's, it's all, we, we start watching ourselves, comparing ourselves to others. Uh, and what they have, what they do, what their reputation is, what, you know, all of these things that make us who we are always seem to be in relationship to other people, better or worse. For myself, I have found that it is incredibly helpful to look at people that I'm having a hard time loving and seeing their vulnerabilities. Uh, I, the family I grew up in, I, I have a, a, a very harsh father uh, who really did think that the main thing a father was supposed to do was discipline his children. Well, that is a father. If it's hard to love God and God is like that, it's also hard to love a father who is like that. But I struggled most of my life under the help of the, with the help of the Abbas and Amas, uh, whom I met first when I was in graduate school. I struggled to love my father. Uh, and, but I was too afraid of him. I was just always terrified of my father. Until I was in my 40s, almost 50, I guess, when I was shown a picture of my father when he was about six years old. And in that picture, I could see a child who was so vulnerable to hurts. And seeing the face of that child who was so vulnerable to hurts, I could remember the stories that I had heard from his sister, my aunt, and some from his mother, my grandmother, and some from him about what a really harsh family he grew up in. He grew up with parents who, I, I, they loved him, I think, when he was a grown up, but I really don't think they loved him as a child. They criticized him all the time. And what he learned to do was to become tough, to survive all that. And I never understood that until I saw this picture of my father as a little child. I had a similar experience one time with a person I didn't even know. And of course, we're called to love the people we don't know as much as the people we do know. But I was in... Uh, uh, a hospital getting ready to have a test or two, nothing serious, but enough to be in the hospital for it. Uh, but when a man came in, I was still in the waiting room, an elderly man, maybe he was 90, I don't know. He was probably my age right now, which is almost 80, but he seemed incredibly old. Um, he does in my memory too. Uh, and he was given a, a cup of something that he was supposed to drink 
because he was having some kind of a stomach test and he was given some probably not perfectly horrible thing to drink, but something that he certainly didn't want to drink. Uh, probably it was an awful texture, tasted bad and so forth. And as I just glanced over at this man, it was as though I suddenly saw him as a little child, it, the dismay on his face uh, and the fear and the helplessness. And I was just overwhelmed with love for this man who was having to go through this. And I saw that he was still a child as we all really are. We're grown-ups. Most of us are getting to be old grown-ups, but we also are still the child that we were in terms of our fears and our anxieties and so forth. And so I find it very helpful when I'm trying to be non-judgmental, and I certainly don't succeed a lot of the time, is to imagine uh, the child that person once was. Uh, and I may have pictures to look at. There may be things or stories that I've been told. This, is, this works, of course, in families where stories are passed down. Uh, so one more point, and that is that we are called not just to love God, neighbor, but also to love ourselves. And the question here is why and how do we love ourselves? Now, we only have a couple minutes left, but we don't need a lot more than a couple minutes at this point. The way we learn to love ourselves is to really, really understand that we are part of the people we share our lives with. In the body of Christ, we are all one body. So, when I love another person, I am also loving myself. When I reject another person, poo-poo them and dismiss them as not worthy of my time or my energy or, or my regard, we're also rejecting ourselves because in Christ we are one body which Christ is the head. So when I love my neighbor, when I love God, I'm also loving myself. But if I'm loving myself in that way, then I can't use language to myself that creates in me an atmosphere and an attitude of self-hatred. Uh, that is... That seems obvious, but it isn't. Uh, but there's not a whole lot more to be said about it right now. One more thing about the non-judgmentalism, though, and this is true of learning to be non-judgmental toward ourselves as we are learning to be non-judgmental of our neighbors, that these early teachers were convinced that we would only learn to love as we experience uh, other people's radical acceptance of us as the people who we really are, as lovable people, beloved of God and beloved of them too. And this is the thing that I learned from those early teachers. I learned that I was loved. And the odd thing is, is that I learned that I was loved even by these teachers from the fourth fifth and sixth century. Is this possible? Well, I wouldn't think so, but it is. It is. In the, in, in the communion of the saints, we share a common life. In the communion of the saints, we share a common life. And so I really believe my own life was saved by the love of these fathers and mothers from the fourth, fifth, sixth century the ancient world so to summarize again the saying of anthony who was the first of the teachers according to the tradition 
Nobody picks up a bar of iron and starts hammering on it and says, what am I going to make a plowshare or a sword? In the same way, we have to pick what it is that we're aiming at in our life and aim at that. And I hope that that is love and the virtues that foster love. Okay, now I, I could probably go on, well, I know I could go on and talk about these folks for uh, probably for 20 years without stopping, but you will probably be glad that I'm not. Um, so let's quit at this point and uh, let me turn it over to our esteemed leader. And uh, I was hoping we would have time for a question or two. And I, I'm not sure whether we do or not. Do we? Yeah, we do, for sure. Um, if there are questions, um, we certainly have um, five or 10 minutes we can entertain those. If you have a question, you can um, raise your hand in the chat or you can just ask it um, if you have one. Well, I may just have bowled everybody over. <laughs> no, no, Roberta, I have a question. <laughs> I hear that that's Gaytra, even though I can't see it. Is, it is Gaytra. And my question is, as I hear you, um, how do we even begin to heal the divisiveness of the world we're in right now? I mean, even beginning with your relative who cannot, uh, you know, who sends you all this horrible stuff about Kunan and everything else. How do we, how do we, how do we love when somebody can't love, can't accept us or anything that we say or hear, it's so hard to hear them and accept them. Boy, is that ever the truth. And the Abbas and Amas never said that it was easy. They know very well it is hard. I think maybe the first thing we can do is admit, this is really hard, but this is something I'm aiming at rather than something I expect to be able to do by bedtime today. As I said, one little easy thing that, that, that I do is to try to see the vulnerability in, in the person who's giving me a hard time. Now, there are so many other things that need to be done too. One, one of the things, I have trouble, oh goodness, we could really talk about this for ages. Um, I have trouble thinking that if another person doesn't like me that that somehow my job is to make them like me uh, or something something like that in that <laughs> category so that if I have a relative which I do I imagine just about everybody does who uh, is supporting hateful politics uh, that hurt people I, I just have a really hard time knowing how to relate to those people. Uh, but I, I, can, I can tell myself something about how they got that way. Where I live right now in North Georgia, I can remind myself of the strength of the culture up here that, that nobody just sort of starts out hating other people without uh, a support group, so to speak, uh, behind them. The hard thing is to not dismiss people. Uh, one of the things that Dorothea said, that I, I love Dorothea, our person who invented the circle, uh, he, he starts one of his homilies by saying that he had just gotten back from a monastery that had a, a famous monk that uh, everybody said, oh, this guy is so wonderful. He just, uh, he just forgives everybody. He doesn't hold grudges. He, he doesn't even see the sins of other people. 
so Dorotheus thought, boy, I got to go see that. He's got some tricks that I don't know. <laughs> see, then they, I could tell you terrible stories about things uh, people did to Dorotheus, but I won't. Um, anyway, Dorotheus says he got to the monastery and he asked to see this monk who was pretty young. And the first thing he did was ask him, how do you take these hateful things that are said to you and about you? How do you what do you do with it? And he said, I just regard these people as barking dogs. <laughs> and Dorothea says, when I heard that, I was afraid. And that has been an important story for me over the course of my adult life is to not give in to the urge to regard the people who say these hateful things, not to re just regard them as barking dogs, but to remember that they are real people, individuals with individual histories, with vulnerabilities, hurts, joys, but that they are real people. It is so hard sometimes, though, to do that. I know it is. But Dorothy says just a little bit at a time, just a little bit. At a time. Maybe the, the, the obnoxious relative just send them a Christmas card, you know. I, I don't know. I haven't been entirely successful with my own family uh, around this particular point. In fact, I've been spectacularly. Uh, unsuccessful a lot of my life um, because I've pursued a life that didn't really fit with their idea of what a woman should be doing. Uh, I don't know if that's helpful or not, Gator. Uh, we all have to find our way. Are, are you there somewhere? Yes, Bert, I'm right here. Yes, it is helpful. Thank you. Thank you. The, the important thing is that hard and that we have to and to get down on ourselves for not being able to do it makes it harder not easier yes very true so if our goal is to love then we don't want to make it hard ourselves either to love god or to love the neighbor I guess we have time for just one more question, if it's a short question. <laughs> Words are more or less. Yeah. Um, Glenna, you had a, a question in the chat. Did you want to expound on that? Uh, thanks, Brenda. It was actually it wasn't me. It was my partner who is right here. So I'll let her. Okay. <laughs> uh, and this is this is Marie. Well, I, I just wanted to see in the bigger scheme of things as you your worldview where where ethics and and the place of ethics comes in your understanding of the of love and, and our approach to each other um, and being non judgmental but still having some ethical norms. Yeah, this. This is not the sort of question I thought of when I was thinking of a three word question. Uh, but <laughs> oh. but I, I will tell you that uh, the Abbas and Amas were not really saying nobody under any circumstances should do any judging at all. Mm -hmm. um, they made provision for you know if you're a judge for a living that's what you're supposed to be doing you know <laughs> yeah. be, uh, making choices and and passing judgments uh what they were very cautious about though was uh taking over passing judgments on other people as though we know that that's what god would do in the same way that we're mm -hmm. doing mm -hmm. If you want to see a terrible example of that, look at the struggles of the United Methodist Church over the uh, the uh, uh, gay and lesbian issues. Yeah. Um, boy, that's, you know, you want to know what God thinks? Well, let me, you know, we, we're not in that position. 
what we are in a position to do is say that we know that God loves all people that God has created and that God loves all those people equally and welcomes those people and wants those people. Uh, that we can say uh, in terms of uh, setting up an ethic, it's just a matter, I say just, but I take the word just out there. It is a matter of understanding the goal of what are, we're doing, that the goal of what we're doing is to become loving and to help other people love, not because it's bad to judge, but because of the relationship between judging and being able to love. Uh, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I know it's not enough, yes. but you best I can do. Um, uh, no, it yeah. it is helpful, and it's cl it's clear it's a much longer discussion for another day. But thank you, thank you very much. Well, I I wish we had. Um, I think we probably could go another long while asking questions, but I want to respect our time because I know some of you are um, looking to leave your residences and get over here for church. Um, but I, I really appreciate um, your words, Dr. Bundy, and uh, the focus on love and the connection to Wesleyanism. That was very helpful um, for me as Thank well. You. Brent, uh, before we close, uh, yes, tell everybody to be sure and see Sandra Gibson's chat where she, you, she quotes you, uh, uh, Roberta, that God's love is like that of a crazed grandmother. Yes, that's, that's <laughs> I wanted to be sure everybody saw that. That is oh, a good one. Or a crazed person who's fallen in love. Right. <laughs> well, thank you so much for, for being with us today. I, I hope we'll have opportunities in the future to do this again and maybe with more question, more time for question and answer. Um, thank you, everyone, for, for being here. I um, hope you'll be back. Next week, um, Dr. Elliot will be with us um, to speak on um, our theological task and theology in the Methodist Church and how we approach that, which is a, a large discussion in our denomination right now. So, um, Dr. Bonnie, would you mind praying for us before we go? Oh, of course. Thank you. God, who loves us more than we can ever imagine, who loves the neighbor we can't stand, more than we could ever imagine. Help us to love well. Help us to be patient with ourselves and to grow into that love and knowledge of your wonderful love and your goodness. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you again. And um, everyone, stay safe and dry. Have a good week. We'll see you again next week. Thank you for having me.